We're back. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of No Niche Zone, the podcast about everything. I'm your host, Priscilla Davies, and um, we have a, a fun show in store for us today. I think so. Uh, I think so. Um, how has everybody's week been? I hope it's been fruitful and enjoyable. Um, I have a fun announcement to make. I don't know if you guys remember, but a few months back, I mentioned that I had been shooting a show uh, for Dropout TV, and I can finally talk about it, because ah, it's coming out in a couple weeks. Um, if you love Drag Race, if you love Monet Exchange, if you love comedy, if you're a Dropout TV fan, you're gonna love this show, okay? It's called Monet's Slumber Party, and I am one of the regular cast members on the show. So uh, it's dropping July 19th on Dropout TV, so if you if you mess with Dropout TV, make sure you come see me over there. Uh, we dropped some trailers, it's already getting a big buzz. Uh, so I love how I say we, like I was involved in production. Yeah. We we dropped some trailers. <laughs> they dropped trailers and sent me an email with links. Um, but it's really exciting and I can't wait for you guys to see it. You know, I'll be posting little clips here and there when I can. I don't I don't know. I actually TikTok and all the others will probably um classify it as unoriginal content. So <laughs> maybe I can't. Maybe I can't post a trailer with my own likeness in it. I don't know. We'll find out. Um, but please, y'all. Check it out. It's it's really a great show. It's, it was a lot of fun to shoot. So I can imagine it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. And the trailer was really fun. So I'm like, ah. And you're going to see, listen, you're going to see a lot of your your faves in there. You're going to see your drag race faves in there. You're going to see some of your TV uh, faves. <laughs> There's one person in there. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to keep my mouth shut so hard because I don't want the smoke. But there's one person in there who's been in the news lately. Um, <laughs> let me just say this. When it comes up, we'll talk about it. And I'm going to try to tiptoe around it. Uh, yeah. OK. <laughs> when that time comes, we'll talk about it. Um, but yeah, guys, definitely check it out. July 19th. I'm going to keep boosting it because I'm so excited about this project. And with that being said, let's jump into the show. Friends, we recently witnessed the first, hopefully the last, because <laughs> it was a disaster, <laughs> of the 2024 presidential debates. <laughs> Did you guys see this? How, raise your hand. Did you watch? <laughs> Did you watch the debate? I unfortunately missed the vast majority of the debate. Um, I was out in the streets. And then by the time I got home, I only caught like the last like 15, 20 minutes. Um, but if I was to sum it up based on what all of the airwaves, the pundits, what all of the media is saying about this debate, I would sum it up as... Feeble Joe <laughs> versus Lai <Lye> McLiar. <laughs> That's what I would sum that debate up as. Um, one of the big takeaways from this debate that everybody was talking about is the fact that in the beginning of the debate, President Joe Biden was struggling, struggling to get full thoughts out, struggling to get full sentences out, struggling to stay on track mentally. And this was a big buzz because, as we all know, this is one of the biggest criticisms about Joe Biden is that he's too old to be running for president again. The man is in his 80s. And we have literally seen Joe Biden's decline over his four years in, in office and from his whole entire political career. It's funny, he actually mentioned it during the debate that he happened to be one of the youngest people to enter Congress when he first showed up. So it's just so interesting that now he's dipping out as one of the oldest people. Um, but yeah, that was the big buzz is that basically he was struggling really hard. Now I said, I didn't, I didn't catch that part. I didn't see it. And it's, I think it's interesting that I haven't seen any clips of it either circulating. Um, but I will say when I did show up, that was the first thing that I noticed. I was like, uh Oh, What's up with Grandpa Joe? <laughs> Uncle Joe, what's up? I was a little taken aback. I was like, ooh. One of the things was his voice. That was one thing they really were mentioning, is that his voice, he was very, very hoarse. You could barely understand anything that he was saying. 
And it was very evident when I came in at the end. Um, but I will say that he definitely recovered towards the end. Like, regardless of his demeanor and his presentation and the quality of his voice, the facts and the content was still there at the end when I showed up, okay? Um, but apparently he was having trouble in the beginning uh, keeping up with <laughs> the Jones, shall I say, keeping up with his thoughts and keeping up with everything. Um, so, and then on the other side... <laughs> On the other side, <laughs> we had a perfect president with perfect debate skills. He never messed up once. <laughs> this dude, Donald J. Trump, sat on that podium and spent a whole two hours just lying. Lie, lie, lie. Pretty much nothing that came out of that man's mouth was truthful. I just wonder sometimes, like, I just, I, I really, I really want to know and maybe I don't want to know, but I really would love to speak to some real legit Trump supporters. I really don't want to talk to them, by the way. <laughs> I want other people to do this. But I would love to know what is it that makes them want to vote for him? Because, I, you know, like, miss me with that policy nonsense. He had the, No, he didn't. If you really actually look at the policies, you know he didn't. At like, like every other goddamn Republican president out here, he raised the deficit, tax everything, you know, like put us in debt. You know, he's the reason why we are where we are today in part. Um, so miss me with that policy stuff. Um, and then like miss me with that like drain the swamp stuff because he is the swamp. He is the swamp. I mean, he may not be a career politician, but this guy is a career rich man who had his hands in politics <laughs> from day one. He's been in the mix. This isn't his, that, this wasn't, last time wasn't the first time he attempted to be president. And he's, he's hand in hand with all of these mother, you know what's out there. And he didn't do anything to drain the swamp. He just perpetuated the swamp and kept it going. So I just wonder when you have a presidential candidate who's literally out there talking like a, ma a maniac, no nonsensical, like, non-factual, just straight up bold face lying directly to the American people. I just wonder when you're watching him do all that, are you like, yeah? <laughs> or, you know, part of me wonders if it's just like, you just love to see him fuck shit up and you just want to destroy everything and you don't care what anything he does. You're like, yes, fuck it up. Fuck it up. Because that's the only thing that I can imagine. I just don't think that anybody with any sense can watch that man and be like, that is great presidential material. This guy's got it. And anybody who paid any attention would say that he was a great president. He did so much. Do y'all remember COVID? <laughs> when it first started? Do you remember the hell we were in? Because he was president. Okay? Do you remember when he told y'all to take horse tranquilizer? What was it? Horse horse tranquilizer? I forgot what it was. Horse antibiotics? When he went and got himself the, va the vaccine <laughs> behind closed doors? Y'all remember that? So I'm just always mystified when I actually see Trump performing. I'm like, I can't believe people look at this and go, well, yes, thumbs up. We want it. And not only do we want it, but we're going to go out and vote for it. It's just wild. It's just wild. Um, like I said, when I came in towards the end, I was taken aback. I'm not going to lie by Joe's performance. However, like I said, the substance was there. And I've mentioned this before on the podcast. Like, I am by no means a Democrat lover, all right? I just have to caucus with them because they're the only ones that are closest to my politics here. But one of the things that I can give Joe Biden credit for is he still got it, bro. He still got it. I, I, I As much as, like, his demeanor kind of doesn't give that off, when you listen to what he says and the substance of what he's saying... He's he's on point. Not only can that motherfucker respond to the question, he can pull out facts and statistics to back it up. And he always goes back to his message and promotes the things that he's done in his uh, administration. So, I mean, just on a substantive level, I have yet to see, you know, and again, like I said, I came in later, so I did not see the beginning and I tried to look up clips. I couldn't find any. But I will say I have not, I've yet to see him just be totally lost in the sauce. Even though he looks like it. I'm not going to lie. He looked like it. He looked like he don't know where he at. 
90% of the time, you know, and his little old man shuffle, no shade. You know, we're, we're probably all going to have old people shuffles at some point in our lives. But honestly, I'm already starting to have one. Okay. Literally, literally this week I went work. I went to work out. I got in the shower. I'm showering. I want to turn. My knee almost gave out on me. Okay. So one thing I learned as I've gotten older is I don't make fun of old people because we're all going to end up there one day if we're lucky, because that's the point. Right. But I'm not going to lie. Based on how he looks, it it it, 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 it was concerning. It was concerning. I'm not going to lie. But in terms of the content, I mean, and you got to understand, this isn't just one event that this guy does. This guy does event after event after event. It's not like they just pull it out and for, pull him out for one second, slap him across the face, pump him with some Coke. <laughs> Take a bump, Joe. Now get out there. You know, like, it's not like they do that. It's like he he's, he's doing town halls. He's doing all this stuff. So there's plenty of opportunities for him to be having these, you know, moments where people can be concerned. And it... The point that I'm trying to make is that if, if they were going to catch him out there, they would have caught him out there already. OK, so I still, you know, <laughs> I still got to give props for props are due and I got to give props to Uncle Joe. It, at that age, I would have quit. I would have quit. But he's still pushing and he's still got sauce. He really does. Um, one of some of the highlights. <laughs> that I saw at least uh, was, of course, <laughs> Donald Trump describing his presidency. I, I had a perfect presidency. Every part of my presidency was perfect. It was a 100 star rating on the presidential ratings. <laughs> you guys don't know about presidential ratings. They're very 100% real. I promise you. Melania gets them in the mail every week. <laughs> That was basically the essence of his whole entire... Actually, no, it was more like this. It was, my presidency was perfect. Everything I did was excellent. I never messed up once. And the immigrants are coming to steal your jobs, especially black people. <laughs> if you're... I, I, I mean, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> if you're a black person, the Mexicans are coming to steal your job. And also, if you're an American, period, point blank. We're going to close the borders. My presidency was excellent. That right there is a summary <laughs> of everything Donald Trump said in a two hour debate <laughs> with Joe Biden. OK. And then there was the moment where they were going back and forth about their golf swing. <laughs> Donald Trump really tried to say that he's like, you know, I tried to get Joe Biden to go play golf with me, but he can't handle it. <laughs> He can't even, he can't handle it. And then Joe Biden clapped back, was like, <laughs> his golf swing was better. Than, I mean, I was, I'm not gonna lie. In the moment, it was funny. But also, I was laughing to not cry. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm like, here we are at the precipice of the end of this faux democracy that we've created in this country. We have unemployment out the wazoo. Actually, unemployment's been doing pretty good, by the way. I shouldn't say that. We have inflation out the wazoo, the deficit, all the tax, blah, 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 you know, abortion, right? All these horrific things happening. And the two presidential candidates are sparring about their golf swings. <laughs> Like I said, I laughed not to cry, okay? Um, but it was actually pretty funny. And again, it was another moment of like, Joe's with it. He's here. He could cla he clapped back and he clapped back quick. He's like, I'll go out there. I'll go out there with you on the golf range. So after the debate, the pundits went ham. You know, everybody, especially on the Democratic side, was freaking out. And the question in everybody's mind was, do we replace Joe Biden? Is it time for us to collectively admit that it's time to replace Joe Biden, that Joe Biden is tired, it's time for him to retire and move on, and we need to bring in a more robust, younger person into there? And this was the debate. Everybody going back and forth. You know, oh, you know, we need to get rid of Joe Biden. No, we shouldn't get rid of Joe Biden. Is the DNC going to listen? What should we do? So that's that's basically like what everybody's, you know, worried about. Um, and, and what's so interesting on the flip side of that is that with regard to Donald Trump's performance, everybody's just like, eh, that's how he always is. He's a liar and a liar. Like, and it kind of sucks because it's like, 
you know, Donald Trump has lowered the bar so goddamn low that no matter what he does, nobody blinks, nobody flinches. Everybody just goes like, eh, that's just what, that's how he is. That's what it is. And it's like, y'all, we are affected by how he is. So we can't just be dismissive of how he is because that's just the way he is. He's a, he is a menace. He's a menace to society, literally. <laughs> the only reason why he, he has sucked us, the American people into his legal drama. That's the only reason why that he's, he's running for presidency. He don't want to be pre He didn't want to be president the first time. <laughs> It was a freaking, um, it was a bit gone wrong. <laughs> he was just trying to sell some books and some Bibles and some gold sneakers. He wasn't trying to be president. And he damn sure doesn't want to be president now. The only re reason why he's running is so he can keep his ass out of jail. We already know he, he's already been convicted once so far of a criminal offense and we're waiting in a couple weeks we're going to get his sentence and he's already been convicted of all of these civil offenses half a billion dollars worth and he has three more criminal trials coming down the pipe this fool is trying to get his ass out of jail by becoming president i mean it it, it <laughs> imagine if that's where you were like in order for me to get out of jail, <laughs> I have to win the American presidential election. <laughs> I mean, the stakes are high here. But um, I just think it's so messed up how, like, on his end, he's just allowed to be a, a, a bumbling idiot, liar, lying as hell, okay? And everybody's just like, eh, no biggie. But look at Uncle Joe. His voice was harsh. harsh. He, he had a frog in his throat, and he wasn't focused, you know? Do I think that they're actually going to switch Joe Biden out? Of course not. The DNC, y'all, I need y'all to take a seat. The DNC ain't going nowhere with Joe Biden, okay? One thing that Democrats are not known for is taking risks. Democrats are not risk takers. They are safety sallies. They're always going to choose the safe route, the most stable route. There is no way that they're going to boot Joe Biden off of the ticket four months before the election after investing all this time, money, and energy into him and his election campaign. It's just not going to happen, y'all. It's just not going to happen. And a lot of people, you know, on the internet as well are like, well, now's the time. Like, they can just, it's not going to happen. They're not, that's not the, de the DNC. That's not Democrats' MO. They're not the shake it up party. They're not going to make a big major shake up four months before the election, unless they have to. Now, will Joe make it? We're going to find out. I think he will because... That motherfucker got that stubborn Scranton energy. You, I mean, I can, I can feel it, you know, but he's not, they're, they're not, he's not leaving and they're not going to send him packing. And, and, you know, do I agree with that? I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, from a strategic standpoint to me, yeah, it's dumb to like undo everything four minutes or four months before the election. So from a strategic standpoint, I don't think it's a smart idea either. Um, but you know, I never was a fan of Joe Biden running for president the first time. You know, I was disappointed as hell that they put him in there the first time. So I, I mean, also I'm a messy bitch who loves drama. So if they dump him, I ain't gonna lie. I would love that. I would be there with my cup and my tea ready to watch, but I don't think it's going to happen. And I just strategically speaking, I just don't think that it makes any sense and it's worth it. First and foremost, the vast majority of people who are voting blue are vote blue no matter who. So what's the point of shaking things up when the vast majority of people are going to vote blue no matter what? And then Joe Biden actually has a good record. He actually was a good president. And I, I don't want to say I hate to say that, but like, actually, I'm happy to say that because I really did not have any faith in him. And I actually think he's done a pretty good job in office. He actually really has. He's done some real legitimate stuff that's helped people. And he doesn't get the credit that he deserves. Um, so, yeah, it makes no sense for them to try to, like, jump ship now. It's just too late in the game. And I totally understand that. One thing I'm going to tell you is they are going to make sure that Joe Biden makes it to November, whatever the hell, uh, the 5th or 4th, whatever. They are going to make sure that fool is going to make it to that date, to election date, even if they have to weekend at Bernie's him, okay? <laughs> Y'all remember weekend at Bernie's? <laughs>
I mean, they're already weakened at burning him right now. Let's keep it real. Like, they pretty much wheel him out there, slap him on the back of the head, and just crank him up, and he starts going. So they're going to they're gonna take him to the end. And I, I don't blame them. I think it makes sense. And I think that let's be freaking for real, guys. Come on, guys. We all knew this is where we were heading. We all knew this was the plan. Have Joe Biden come back as the incumbent. Have him get elected. And we know what's going to happen. He's not going to make it out his second term. If he if he even makes it to, to January, I'd be like, wow. I feel like, here's my prediction. If Joe Biden wins the election, by January 2025, he's going to be stepping down. Kamala Harris is going to step up as the president. And Gavin Newsom is going to step up as the vice president. Why do I say Gavin Newsom? Because that motherfucker is out here stomping the pavement being a surrogate, quote, surrogate for Biden out here. He's traveling the country, you know, speaking on Biden's uh, behalf. When after the debate went down, he was one of the first people to be, you know, do the circuit. So I feel like he's not doing that for no reason. He's doing that because he's trying to set himself up to be the vice president. And it, 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 let's keep it real. It's going to be a good look if that happens. We will have two robust young politicians, first black a woman president and youthful politicians. Gavin Newsom looks like a movie star. You, you know, as much as we try not to be uh, superficial, let's be real. Looks matter. And I see it. I, that's that's the vision that I see happening. Let's see what happens. But I don't know. You know, there's a lot that can happen between now and November and a lot that can happen between now and 2025. Uh, but that is my prediction. And I think that everybody else is kind of assuming the same thing. Look, we just need Joe to get to the finish line. And once he gets to the finish line, then we can start making the changes. And I think that that is what the plan is. And in the meantime, we're going to weekend at burning him <laughs> And I can't even say it. In the meantime, we're going to weekend at Bernie him all the way to the finish line. So, folks, that was our first 2024 presidential debate of the season. Um, one thing I will say before I close out on that is I think it was smart of them to have this debate so early in the season. I don't know if that was strategy or just what it was, but having it so early in the season benefits Joe because by the time, you know, the, the news cycle is two weeks in two weeks, no one's going to care about the fact that Joe Biden was stumbling over his words at the presidential debate. Let's keep it for real. So by the time the actual election comes, this debate is going to be in the rear view mirror. And I think they were smart. They were smart to do it early, which is another reason why I'm like, they ain't getting rid of Joe. They not, they know that people are going to forget about this in two weeks and move on and vote blue, no matter who. Okay. Let's move on. Shall we? <sighs> the diaspora wars have been activated once again. This time it's team USA versus Team South Africa. <laughs> and what have the diaspora wars been ignited over, you ask? None other than South African singing sensation, Grammy winning artist, Tyla. You know Tyla. Make me swear. Make me the water girl, right? Tyla, water. She's been popping up lately and popping off lately, and it has created a real discourse and a real discord amongst the diasporans, the black diasporans, and especially between black America and South Africa, okay? Now, what has been going down? Let me give you a quick little recap, all right? So... Basically, Tyla came to the United States maybe like, what, a year or two ago, right? And she started, you know, trying to get out there, da -da, doing her thing, right? And so for those who don't know what she looks like or you haven't looked her up, Tyla would be, in the United States, considered pretty much a phen phenotypically black woman, okay? She's she's like brown skin. Some people might call her a little bit light skin. And, you know, she's always wearing cornrows. She's always got her hair braided up. And so in the United States, phenotypically, we see that as a black person, right? So Tyler was out here doing her thug thizzle and, you know, she was at black events, you know, going to to these black award shows, et cetera, et cetera. And so 
people, American people were like, you know, oh, look at Tyla. And got on the internet, got on Twitter, and we're talking about Tyla neutrally and happened to identify her as a black woman, okay? They're like, oh, look at this black girl. I never seen so-and-so with a black girl before, right? That was a huge mistake because South African Twitter, South African TikTok, South African Instagram, every South African social media site you can think of ran. They ran to the internet to let us dumb Americans know that Tyla is not black. She's colored. She's colored. And in South Africa, she would be considered colored, not black. Okay? They told us to shut our goddamn mouths, <laughs> that we didn't know what we were talking about, and that she was colored. And so started the drama. Now, obviously, black Americans were taken aback because in the United States, colored is considered a slur when you're describing black people. We stopped using that term colored to describe black people back in the 60s and the 70s. Maybe the 60s. I wasn't there. I wasn't. I don't know if you could tell, but I wasn't. Um, but black Americans were like, whoa, slow. The you said, not only are you telling us that this girl is not black, but now you want us to call her a slur in our language? Are you crazy? And the war began. And the war began. So black Americans were like, we're not calling her colored. This is America. We're not calling her colored. That is a slur here. And South Africans were like, oh, you stupid black Americans. Oh, you Americans, you have no education. Everybody, you know, not everybody in the world is obsessed with race like you are. And you guys only think everything is black and white. We have a different ethnicity. We have a different um, race. Colors, colors are a different race here in South Africa. And we acknowledge them as such. They have their own culture and she's colored. And you need to identify her as such. OK, so the beef is going back and forth. We beefing on the Internet. And I'm sure you're wondering, well, where's Tyla at in all this? <laughs> Tyla is dodging. She's MIA. She's avoiding questions. That's where the hell she is. So for the last few months, Tyla basically ignored all of this discussion, never addressed it, except for in a couple of um, I believe it was one interview for Cosmo. And then there was something else that she talked about. Another, another media outlet, which, you know, I found out through the grapevine. But here's the thing. Cosmo is not a black news outlet. So you went to Cosmo and explained your background, explained what colored men, explained all that stuff. But you did it in a magazine where black people aren't going to be reading it. First red flag, not even first. This is like we're already on third red flag, okay? So you, what I got from that is you were trying to create plausible deniability so that down the line when people would say like, hey, like, you know, you never talked about it, you could be like, yes, I did. I talked about it in Cosmo. The mat, you buried it in Cosmo knowing that black people ain't reading Cosmo. Now, if you had talked about it in Essence magazine, we might have a, a discussion here. You might have a valid point. And the other media outlet that she talked about it in, same thing. Another non-black media outlet. So you buried this information to cover your ass. This was basically a CYA operation so that down the line you could claim plausible deniability and act like, well, I already talked about it. No, you sneakily talked about it and hid it in, in um, media outlets that you knew black people weren't checking for. While simultaneously trying to break into the black music space. Okay? So let's keep all that in mind. So for the last few months, she's been dodging the question. She doesn't respond. She doesn't answer anything. You know, you know, whatever. She avoids it. But her South African um, fans were rabid on the internet, going in on people, okay? Because she is colored. She's not black, okay? And then came... Tyla's Breakfast Club interview. Tyla sat down with the Breakfast Club, another black media outlet. Let's lock that in, okay? Let's clock it, baby. Another black media outlet. She went to this media outlet with her hair cornrow, okay? And, you know, we're going to get into the discussion of that because I know all the South Africans are like, oh, cornrows and... <laughs> 
We're going to get into a discussion. We're, we're going to get into that. So she goes to this black media outlet, The Breakfast Club, and Charlemagne, one of the hosts, which if you're familiar, you know that he's messy. He's he's a messy, messy, messy man. Um, he asks her during the interview to, you know what, let me just play it. And you can see. School, school me on these debates that they be having about your identity as a South African colored person. What, is, what does that even mean? Can we, yeah, can we not, for favor? Oh, I like that. We keeping that in the interview, too. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I like when they talk from the back and say we can't. I like that. I like the character. That's good. That's even better. <laughs> Next one, please. That's even better. <laughs> stupid. So if you're just listening to this, let me describe what happened here. So he asked the question, school us on colored, the colored identity, school us about your identity, and just like, let us know. Tell us what's up, you know? And instead of answering the question, Tyla silently looks back to her people. And then that's when you hear that like weird audio. That's her people talking in the background off camera saying, can we move on? Next question, please. So she went out of her way to avoid answering that question when it was presented to her on a black media website. Okay. So there's been this debate and this drama going on for months and months and months. And she had an opportunity to clear it up. And she chose to remain silent and have her team do her dirty work. And, and if you watch the video, you can see the way she, the energy behind it is like, I'm not even gonna. And she just turns around and looks at her people. I'm not even going to address this at all. Okay. And so this interview ignited a firestorm on the internet because black Americans were asking, why can't she just answer the damn question? Explain colored, explain what colored is. Tell us what you're, you know, y'all South Africans are telling us we're so stupid. We don't know. We can't tell that about, we, it's hard for us to understand different races. Well, now's your opportunity to break it down. And instead you chose to plead the fifth and have your team do the dirty work and move on. Okay. And so a lot of South Africans were in the comments being like, well, she's already said it. Yeah. In that sneaky ass cosmopolitan interview. Sure. She's already said it. She's tired of answering. She doesn't want to have to answer. You guys aren't listening. She didn't want She's, you know, she's tired. She's already said this. And of course came all the you, you Americans, you uneducated, st stupid, dumb, ugly Americans, you know, one thing that gets my goat. <laughs> One thing that yanks my crank is the way foreigners talk about Americans. Like y'all foreigners be hating on Americans so bad. It is so embarrassing. The way you oh, Americans are so dumb. They're so uneducated. Let me break this down for you. We have the same amount of stupid people here as you have in your country. <laughs> Because I've been to some of your countries. <laughs> I've been to a lot of your countries. I'm a well-traveled person. That's another thing. Oh, you Americans, you need to get out of the United States and travel. Uh, I actually am a very well-traveled person. And what's so crazy is a lot of those people who are saying that probably have never even left the African continent. But they're going to tell you that you need to be traveling. You need to get out, okay? Especially South Africa. I mean, where are you going from South Africa? It's so far away <laughs> from everything. I mean, what... <laughs> What's close to South Africa that you can get to quick? <laughs> okay? So one thing that really frustrates me is how they be coming down on Americans. And not just black Americans. It's just like Americans in general. And this happens from all four, especially Europeans, y'all. Especially Europeans. You know, the way they come down on Americans and how uneducated and stupid we are. Like I said, we have the same amount of stupid people here as you have there. And we have the same amount of smart people as you have there. I mean, it's just common sense. There's dumb people everywhere and there's smart people everywhere. Living in a country doesn't make you smart or dumb. If you are painting a whole entire country as stupid and, and uneducated, you are a xenophobe. That is xenophobia. Okay? <laughs> I don't know how, to, how else to, to, to put this 
for y'all, especially y'all meanie South Africans. You are being xenophobic to sit there and say that all Americans are dumb. All Americans are stupid. You're being a xenophobe, period, point blank. And the other the other aspect of this where they're like, oh, Americans, they have no, no, they, they just so obsessed with race. I can't stand when motherfuckers say that shit. They're so obsessed with race. What are you talking about? We didn't invent race. Europeans invented race. So you mean to tell me that the place where the fuck race and racism was invented is less obsessed than the place where they exported that racism to? Y'all be in Europe talking about Americans are so racist and, you know, uh, not sorry, not racist, are so uh, race obsessed. They're so obsessed with race. You know, everything's so black and white. Meanwhile, y'all are leaving the whole entire European Union so that you can keep the immigrants out. Meanwhile, the the far right wing parties of Europe have been rising up since immigration started moving towards Europe instead of the United States. So y'all want to talk about how Americans are so obsessed with race, but y'all motherfuckers are trying to close your, your borders because there's too many black and brown people coming in and you want to ship all of them back. So miss me with that. And let's not act like racism wasn't exported across the whole entire freaking planet. Even the motherland. Y'all are not going to tell me that Americans are obsessed with race and nobody else is when my own dad told me that in his country, Equatorial Guinea, Central Africa, that in his country up until like the 70s, they had to walk off the sidewalk when a white person was walking down the sidewalk in motherfucking Africa. Y'all South Africans want to tell Americans that we're obsessed with race when your country is run by white people. <laughs> Please miss me with that nonsense. Okay. How did, how did your country end up the way it did if there wasn't an obsession with race? Y'all motherfuckers had apartheid up until the 80s. So you mean, you mean to tell me that, oh, it's been 40 years, <laughs> we're done, we've moved on? Don't play with me. And the same thing with Asia, okay? And especially South America. That's another thing. You Latinos, ooh, my Latino cousins, when I, primos y primas, <laughs> listen, escúchame por favor, okay? The way y'all act like only Americans, y'all... Latinos are some of the most race obsessed people. Y'all have a whole phrase, mejorar la raza. For what? For those who don't know, by the way, that means make, <laughs> make the race better. And how do you think they make the race? How do you think Latinos make the race better? By whitening it up, by getting, pro procreating with white people to whiten up the race. Okay. That, that, they have a whole freaking phrase to describe that. But we Americans are the ones that are obsessed with race. Afro-Latinos, indigenous Latinos getting discriminated against left and right. But we Americans are the ones that are obsessed with race. And the same thing in motherfucking Asia. Are you kidding me? Yes, y'all had your shit before uh, colonialism. Your, you know, poor people are out in the sun. That's why they don't like, yeah, okay. But y'all have still been corrupted by white supremacy because it is an international export. Okay? Y'all talk about how we're so obsessed with race. Let your child come home with a black baby daddy or a black baby mama. And let's see how quickly y'all become obsessed with race as well, in addition to. So I just wanted to clear that up real quick because I'm so sick and tired. And, and I say this as somebody who is... A black American is a Haitian American and is an Equatorial Guinean American who has Afro Spaniard family members is Latina and Hispanic. Yeah. Back the fuck up. I know exactly what I'm talking about. I never experienced more racism than I did when I went to Europe. Okay. Multiple times. So much so that I, I decided I don't want to go back, even though I have a whole half of my family in there. Okay. So miss me with that. Oh, only Americans are obsessed with race. Shut the hell up. The reason you think that is because, number one, you're uneducated. And number two, you're a part of the majority. So it's easy for you to act like racism doesn't exist when it's not affecting you. Okay? 
you white Europeans, you black Africans, you mixed Latinos who are all, you know, at the top of the, the totem pole in your communities, you don't deal with racism because you're not, you're not in diverse communities. You don't deal with racism because you're at the top. <laughs> of, course you, of course you don't think racism exists because you're not the one being affected by it. Let me go back to what I was talking about. I just had to go off on that tangent because I'm so sick and tired of this narrative. It's just so frustrating and it's so disrespectful to Americans. <laughs> Excuse me. And also the, the uneducated stuff. Like, please shut the hell up. So anyway, everybody was going off, you know, about this interview with Tyla and how she, you know, ignored Charlemagne's question. And, you know, it, re it resounded, you know, because she ended up, <laughs> she ended up running to Instagram with a response, okay? So the next day, she gets on Instagram and she puts this in her story. Again, same methodology, right? She didn't put it on her page as a permanent, uh, a permanent post. She puts it on her story that she knows is gonna be deleted after 24 hours. And this is what she said, and I quote, you guys... <laughs> Oh, no. Yo, guys. I don't know if that's you or yo. I don't know. Anyway, she says, quote, never denied my blackness. I don't know where that came from. I mixed with black, Zulu, Irish, Mauritian, Indian, and colored. In South Africa, I would be classified as a colored woman. And other places, I would be classified as a black woman. Race is classified differently in different parts of the world. I don't expect to be identified as colored outside of South Africa by anyone not comfortable doing so because I understand the weight of that word outside of South Africa. But to close this conversation, okay, so she letting you know, like, no, 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 boo, I'm writing this because we ending this now. She wants to shut it down. She's not writing this because she wants to explain anything and open up a dialogue. She wants to shut the dialogue down. Uh, she writes, um, to close this conversation... I'm both colored in South Africa and a black woman, dot, dot, dot. As a woman for the culture, it's and, not or. End quote. So you mean to tell me all these months that we've been having this debate about whether or not Tyla is black, whether or not Tyla is colored, whether or not Tyla claims blackness, you didn't say now one of this, these words. And now you suddenly are a black woman. You are, you never said you're, now you're a black woman. You told us you were colored. Your people, all your South African fans came with their fangs to tell us that they, that you were colored. And now suddenly I'm black. It's, it's not an and it's not an, or it's an and, oh, it is. Why didn't you tell that to Charlemagne when you were sitting in his face instead of turning around to your, your staff and having them speak up on your behalf? So now that you got backed up into the corner, now you're a black woman. <laughs> so, of course, at this point, black Americans were not having it. We were like, what the are you like? Because at this point, you're playing in our face, but you always been playing in our face. And I'm going to break down how. But right now, you're especially playing in our face, acting like we were crazy for, for questioning your, your, your race. And so... After she says this, you know, people went off, like I said. They were, like like I said, they were just like, what the hell? Like, why didn't you say this before? Why are you now suddenly a black girl when you didn't want to claim it before? What the hell? And so to add more fuel to the fire, Charlemagne, a few days later, went on a podcast and gave us the behind the scenes details where he explained that when Tyla showed up for her interview at the breakfast club, there were several questions that her team said were off limits. One of those questions being about her race. Okay. And, uh, Charlemagne was like, okay, great. I don't agree. I'm going to ask about that. So, which is his right, just like it's their right to say, hey, we don't want you to talk about these things. And so at that moment, instead of them being like, okay, we're going to scrap the interview, they were like, no, we're just going to go ahead along with it. So, <coughs> excuse me. So they went into this interview knowing that Charlemagne did not agree to their terms and was going to broach the subject, okay? 
So right then and there, that tells us that she was actively trying to avoid talking about it. So when y'all sit here and be like, no, she did talk. No, she had her team specifically tell Charlemagne not to bring that shit up. So she was actively avoiding talking about it. Like I said, she was. Hence the reason why when she did talk about it, it was to non-black outlets. And she only did it a couple times. So at this point now, you know, we've gone to the point where black South Africans, not just black, not black, sorry, colored South Africa, some black South Africans as well. All the South, actually, even some white South Africans try to get up in the comments. I was like, if y'all don't back the hell up out of here, let me tell you, if there's one thing that gives me the heebie-jeebies, it's that black, it's that, that white South African accent. Woo! That Boer accent, that Afrikaners accent, that shit gives me chills down my spine. It is terrifying when I hear the motherfuckers talk, okay? My friend recommended a, a um, real estate agent to me. And when I showed up, she started talking. That bitch had that South African, white lady, South African accent. I mean, when I tell you the chills that shivered me timbers, it was so hard for me to ignore that accent. I, I mean... To me, white South Africans are the scariest of the scariest of the evil white people. The scariest. I will take an, a, a racist redneck <laughs> from the, the depths of, of the down South, <laughs> the deep, deep South, over a white South African any day, because them motherfuckers terrify me. So we had a bunch of, you know, so the discussion is still alive, partly because South Africans, a lot of the South Africans defending Tyla refuse to actually acknowledge what the hell we Americans are saying is our issues with Tyla. Because it wasn't just about the fact that she's identifying as colored and that she wants us to call her colored. It was also about the fact that, well, okay, if you're not colored, I'm sorry, if you're not black and you don't identify as black, then why are you trying to show up in black spaces? Why are you trying to sell yourself to black audiences? Why are you performing at things like the BET Awards? Why are you on The Breakfast Club, which is a notoriously black outlet? It's like y'all are trying to push her into black spaces, but then she doesn't want to claim black. And that's the other aspect of this drama. So I just want to like, Te tweeze, tease it, I guess I should say, tease it a little bit and break it apart because there are multiple facets to this discussion. And I think part of the reason why there's so much uh, vitriol online is because there's so many moving parts that like when you talk about A, then these motherfuckers in South Africa come in and start talking about B. And it's like, but we're not, we're not, that's not, okay? It's multiple things at once. So number one, first is the color thing. South Africans, let me touch your hand when I say this. We understand what colored means. I had to say it slowly because a lot of y'all refuse to accept it because of your bias against Americans and thinking that we're all so dumb and that we're so obsessed with race and we can't tell that there's different races out there. We understand, it's not hard to understand that y'all got, you guys designated a separate race of mixed people. It's not hard, it's not challenging. People may not have been familiar with it, but it takes five seconds to explain it and we understand y'all, we understand. The issue is that we have more problems than just the fact that she's colored. And I just wanted to address really quickly this whole color thing. So basically in South Africa, back during apartheid times, the white government in power decided to create a whole brand new ethnic group slash race called colored people, which were basically mixed people, people like her, like Tyla, who are mixed with Zulu, mixed with uh, Irish, mixed white, Asian and black. OK, and maybe some other stuff in there, too. But basically di very different mixes, right? You could be mixed there's different versions of this. Like some people are colored and have no black blood in them at all. Some people are colored and have no fill in the blank blood in them all. So it, it really depends on who you are. It basically is a designation for mixed people. Okay. Mixed people. And so the government created them as a buffer class in order to help buffer the government, the white government from 
black South Africans who were increasingly getting sick and tired of apartheid and ready to fight. So they created this buffer zone. So this ethnicity, this race of colored was created to prop up white supremacy. They gave colored people a little bit of extra privileges. They told colored people that they were better than those, those blacks, those K words. Yeah. Those K words, they said that they were better than them. They instilled a nice little superiority complex into them. And so the colors created a nice buffer zone, just like in the United States, how the powers that be created a buffer zone with poor white people. Started back in the time of enslavement, right? Because enslaved Africans were starting to link up with poor indentured servants and poor white Americans. They were starting to link up and they were starting to say, hey, uh, we realize we have a common enemy, which is the powers that be. So let's fight against it. And once that happened, the the rich, the rich landowning class was like, we can't have that. Let's give the poor white people a couple of privileges above the black people and they'll do our dirty work for us. And flash forward to 2024 and it's still happening today. <laughs> Look at the police force. The vast majority of the police force are working class white people. Okay. And the same thing happened in South Africa. They created this buffer class so that they could be protected by colored people so that black South Africans couldn't fight for their freedom. Okay. And not only did they create this class, but colored people ran with it. And so now flash forward past the time of apartheid is over and colored people have, an, you know, they have this superiority complex. Not only do they have a superiority complex, but they don't want to be associated with black people. Hence why when we Americans mistakenly identified Tyler as a black person, all of the colored South Africans ran to the comments, ran to the internet to make for damn sure that we would not, how dare we, we call her black. That's really what they were saying in those comments. She's not, she's not a dirty black like y'all. She's a colored. <laughs> and we should show her that respect because nobody wants to be black in their mind. And that's the truth. I did a post on Tyla a couple months ago when this all started stirring. And I and the post was asking black South Africans, what's their relationship like with colored South Africans? And when I tell you, the black South Africans had to hide in my DMs, were terrified to come out and tell me the truth. And they told me the truth. I have DMs of people wrote a whole essay breaking it down for me that basically, you know, they said that the Cape Town colors are problematic. They don't want to be associated with Joe, Joe Town, Joe Berg colors, Johannesburg um, colors. They're OK. They're cool. Like I got all this tea from black South Africans. But ultimately, the consensus was. Colored South Africans do not want to be identified as black and they do not want to be associated with black people. And that's what it is. And that's really the crux of why the hell this shit went down with Tyla, because she has been trained her whole life to not want to be associated with black people and that being associated with black people is a negative thing. So of course she doesn't want to be called colored. Of course she wants to come out here and tell people that she's, she's not black until she got backed up into a corner. So understand that, okay? The second issue here is a lack of respect for black Americans, point blank, period, all right? It is a lack of respect. You cannot come into somebody else's home and then tell them how they're gonna operate. You cannot come into the United States, try to push this, this uh, act on the black community. You want our black dollars to support her, and then she doesn't want to be associated with us. She doesn't want to respect us. She doesn't want to answer people who uh, media outlets question. She wants to ignore those questions because to her, she, she shouldn't have to answer that. What, what do you, how are you going to come into somebody's house, try to ingratiate yourself into, the, into their uh, community, but then you don't think that you are obligated to respond and answer their questions about, about anything, to be quite honest. And that's an issue. There is a lack of respect for black Americans. And I say this as a first generation black American. OK, my parents are immigrants, so I know it's not and it's not just for it's not just South Africans. It's, it's also within this country. OK, a lot of non black Americans disrespect black Americans. They act like black Americans have no culture while simultaneously 
appropriating said culture. They act like black Americans contribute nothing. Don't they? they drag black Americans left and right. There's a lack of respect and this has translated to the whole entire world. Hence why Tyler thought she could come to the United States, come to black American media outlets, and refuse to answer questions that are important to us Ameri black Americans. Um, and the, <laughs> the final thing that I want to address, because I'm running out of time here, is that um, one of the things that I think is missing from this discussion is that none of the South Africans have asked black Americans, why do we care so much? Why do we care so much what Tyla is? Why do we care whether or not she claims blackness? Well, first of all, you don't get to not claim blackness and then, you know, and, and then enjoy the black dollars. That's number one. But also, we South Africans, I need you to listen to me, okay? Because y'all never asked us why we cared. And if you did, you would have got a lesson in history. And that lesson is the fact that this country has a history of blackface, black fishing, brown face, brown fishing, Asian fa Asian fishing, all we have a history of that. We have a history of white music execs, white TV execs, white film execs hiring non-black people to play black roles because they don't want to pay black Americans. It is really that simple. We have a history of non-POC people playing POC in this country or pretending to be POC. Do y'all remember when Pink was black? <laughs> Did y'all forget that? When Pink was black? They tried to push her as a black artist on us, and she was a whole white woman. <laughs> and that's what they tried to do with Tyla. They said, we're going to have her show up emulating, looking like a black woman, but she's not actually black. And she's going to exploit the black American media uh, machine. Because let's be real, when black Americans say something's hot, it's hot all over the world, period. We're going to exploit that media machine while disrespecting black people. OK, we have a history of them doing that. And so Tyla, whether she, she you know, she may be a pawn in this. I don't know. But Tyla is doing the same shit that we've been dealing with for generations and we are trying to fight against. And it is disrespectful to black Americans to do that. And lastly, in conclusion here to Fort with, I just wanted to say that. Tyla's team and Tyla's South African fans failed her. They failed her. Tyla's team, her American team, should have schooled her on these dynamics and made sure that she, she prepared her for these interviews, prepared her for these, these questions, and they didn't do that. They tried to do the, uh, the same old two-step, which is we're just going to sneak this non-black person in here and pretend she's black, but she's really not, but we're going to get them black dollars. And Tyla's South African fans, you failed her. Y'all came into the comments like rabid animals going off on people calling her black, and you're the one. She never said she was. I will give her that. She never said she wasn't black because she wanted to create that plausible deniability. But y'all came in and said it clear as day and told us dumb Americans that we just can't tell the difference. We're so stupid. We don't know better. Y'all did it. You guys, you know, there is a a, a South African uh, TikTok creator, Lulama Hughes, who spoke on this. And she was like, South Africans, we screwed this up for Tyla. OK. She was like, because Tyla, we're not making Tyla money. It's Americans that are making Tyla money. OK, so we need to shut our non paying mouths up and let her go flourish elsewhere. So Tyla's fans, y'all are y'all are the ones that screwed her, too. You could you should have kept your mouth shut. You should have kept your mouth shut or at the very least, you should have kindly, kindly explained what the difference is. But you couldn't do that because the essence of the colored identity is anything but black. That's what it is. Don't identify me as black. And that's something y'all got to deal with. That's none of my business. I don't, I, I'm not from South Africa, but that's something that y'all got to deal with. Because you basically set Tyler up to a point where her career, her U.S. career is pretty much over before it started. Because one thing I can tell you is that we Americans are like, girl, take that shit back home. We don't want it. You made us so sick. You, your team, your fans disrespected us so freaking hard, made us so freaking sick. 
Take that shit home. Because we never asked you to come here in the first place, baby girl, which is another reason why you should have showed up here with some humility and respect for black Americans, especially as you're trying to ingratiate yourself into our community and you want our hard-earned dollars to support you. Okay? So in conclusion, y'all, I'm happy to see black people in America being like, we're done with this. We're tired of y'all trying to sell these biracial people, mixed people to us as black people and not giving us our due and respecting us. We're tired of it. And I'm so happy to see people put the foot down because I feel like Tyler and Tyler's team, they were like, oh, we're going to get the Meghan Markle treatment, baby. We're going to get the, the Nara Smith treatment, baby. You know, we're, we don't have to, she don't have to claim black, but she gonna get them black dollars. And unfortunately, you screwed yourself, girl. You screwed yourself, your team screwed you, and your fans screwed you. And with that being said, <laughs> oh my God, I had more things to talk about today, but I guess I'll have to save them for next week. Guys, you can follow us across all platforms at No Niche Zone Pod. Subscribe to our YouTube at No Niche Zone Pod. Watch some videos on my YouTube, please. I'm trying to get my watch hours up, y'all. I'm trying to get my public watch hours up. So watch some videos. You can also find us on Discord at No Niche Zone Pod as well. You can follow me at Pris the Goddess across all platforms. I got to go. <laughs> I talked way too much, guys. <laughs> That's a sign that I got to go. Uh, you can catch me at Pris the Goddess across all platforms. And you can email us your listener letters at uh, to no niche zone at gmail.com. Guys, I got to get the hell out of here. I'll see you next time.